de Arquitectura, Interiorismo, Ingeniería y Urbanismo en el Mundo. Con sede en Chicago, fue fundada en 1936. Actualmente cuenta con 11 oficinas distribuidas en Estados Unidos, Inglaterra y Asia. Ha completado más de 10.000 proyectos en más de 50 países. Douglas Voigt dirige el Departamento de Diseño Urbano, City Design Practice, y es autor de la torre más alta del mundo, Burj Khalifa. Los proyectos recientes incluyen el Plan Maestro East Riverfront en Detroit, Michigan, Lincoln Yards en Chicago, Illinois, y, sin, y la Central Barangaroo en Sydney, Australia. Agradecemos el apoyo de SOM. Démosle la bienvenida a Mextrópoli 2019. I would first like to thank the organizers of Mixtropoli for creating this dialogue about design and our response to important issues facing the health of our planet and of our cities. It's a privilege on behalf of everyone at SOM to be here today speaking with you about not only how we as a practice look and research these issues, but how we develop a multidisciplinary response. The presentations earlier this morning were extraordinary and inspiring, both in breadth and in showing the ability of design to have impact. This has always been a place of great importance to us and our role at SOM in helping to shape cities that is at the core of our firm. Today, I would like to propose an idea about humanness of cities and the need for invention in how we design the future. This idea is not new. In fact, back in uh, 1933, at the Century of Progress, the firm found its footing and found its beginning in exploring these ideas about the future. Many innovations were brought forward in terms of how we looked at design, how we looked at mobility, how we looked at engineering and its integration within the built environment. The ambitions of the firm never stopped there at the Century of Progress and the World's Fair, and we've continued to push the limit of what's possible, whether it's the tallest mixed-use building of its time, whether it's working closely with artists such as Picasso to bring incredible works of art to the public realm and within the city. And we've continued to explore the best ways to not only shape the skyline, but to address the issues of how we humanize high density within our city. And so I could talk about many of those projects today but I'm not, because what we're dealing with and the urgency is around issues that are much larger than any one design practice. And together we must tackle the issues of climate change. We must understand how to appropriately address increases in emissions that have happened across that same time we were building and looking at urban migration across our planet. And we know quite well that this is tied to urbanization. And so how we as a profession respond, how we collaborate with unlike collaborators to find the breakthroughs, because this isn't slowing. And in fact, projections today suggest that over 70% of the world's population will live in cities by 2050. This is at the heart of what defines our practice. Innovation and experimentation in addressing the real issues of place within places like London. This was in 1985 before Canary Wharf, now in a state that sees over 100,000 people working there every day outside of central London, but has also seen that these places evolve and adapt over time, and that now 20% of the 
of the population that works at Canary Wharf lives in and around the borough on the east side. And I think what we've found is that cities are informed by movement, their connections to transit choices, the importance of walkability, the relevance to remain compact, diverse, and vibrant. And we've seen this at Canary Wharf, that those connections have expanded beyond the traditional boundaries, have engaged the communities north, south, and east, and have taken forward that spirit of invention, and that with the opening of the cross rail line coming across this part of London, we've seen new ways to introduce nature into the design of the station, such as the work here by Foster and Partners at Crossrail. This idea of mobility and how we connect with the choices we have available is important to understand in the context of the environment we create. This is Denver Union Station. I don't think you'd see many of those cars today, but you do still see the station and its importance within the fabric of Denver as it looks to sustainable and livable growth and development of their central city. And that through the insertion of a very thoughtful, crafted solution to integrate new forms of transportation and mobility, we can create the aspect of discovery, of excitement within the public realm, a place that celebrates the coming together of transit, but also brings new use to the existing structure and provides a framework, and in some ways, a way of looking at future investment in both people and place. This is something coming from Chicago we take great pride in. We were sort of very fortunate with the vision of Daniel Burnham to create an open waterfront for all. And that here at Millennium Park, the last remaining piece, one of the last remaining pieces of that puzzle, we had to think very differently on how we would approach and fill the gap to connect not only across to the lakefront, but sustain the transportation and parking infrastructure that existed on site and was vital to the vibrancy of downtown. And I'm sure as many are you aware, the result has been spectacular in terms of creating a destination, but also becoming a multimodal hub integrated with the transit below, integrated with bicycles, integrated with the aspect of creating place and the front yard for the rest of the city. Many other architects, such as Frank Gehry, and many other artists have sort of grabbed onto this idea and seen this as a place to find inspiration, to allow us to interact with art in new ways, but to also understand how that art is critical to the sense of place. Now in Chicago, in one of the most beautiful aspects of Millennium Park, is that it also supports the city's motto of living in the garden, herbs and horto, and the importance of nature in our cities. But we've been experimenting with this work outside of downtown, looking at former industrial sites, thinking of new ways that we could integrate smart cities, new technologies, be more responsive to the conditions and how we look at energy, water, and waste. And that all sounds great. But for us, and working with engineers in Copenhagen, Ramble, we found a very simple formula of how we can look at reducing carbon emissions. If we look at reducing the uh, content in the carbon uh, and how we produce energy by 50%, if we approve efficiencies actually within the facilities and the buildings themselves, and we look at the system that actually distributes and monitors and rationalizes uh, and optimizes that use of energy, we can see dramatic savings and benefit in carbon emissions. 
by taking a more holistic view at how we uh, consider infrastructure. And then to put that back into the context of urban design, architectural design, and placemaking. So why is this important? As I started, there are many cities today that fall into this category. There are many more cities that are going to be up to 5 million people by the year 2030. There will even be more up to 10 million. And I think what's sort of most daunting is how we look at this, which is the expanding footprint and urbanization within what's been called mega regions. And today there's about 21 of these. Mexico City is one of these mega regions. It's expected that the number of these cities and these regions will grow to over 40 in the next 10 years. And so there's no time to wait. The urgency is now. We have to find ways to address this because we know the impacts. We know the irreversible results. And we know that we perhaps have a small window of time in which we can act and we can have profound impact on our built environment. And I think many of us can relate to conditions about resiliency, about future proofing, about thinking about the natural environment, not just the built environment, whether it's too much water, whether it's not enough water, or that there is enough resiliency within the system itself to sustain and adapt as conditions emerge. So I go to uh, this point, which I think is interesting. It was um, first published in a, in a book by uh, Jonas Salk and his son Jonathan Salk about carrying capacity of our planet. And the question we have, you can see the dashed line here, is are we at that tipping point? Are we at that threshold? What are the decisions we have to make now to sustain a more healthy and livable future? And do we need a new model at how we look at urbanization? In many ways, this was at the heart of SOM and our, the founders of the firm. It was an architect, but it was also an engineer and a manager, a multidisciplinary approach that looked at the importance of structure, the efficiency in ways to optimize those resources. Perhaps many of you have seen the exhibit, and I think uh, my partner Bill Baker's in the audience, they've, they've called it rigid origami. But this poetry of how structure, design, and craft can come together. But yet, this didn't come uh, sort of without any research itself in terms of further investigation, iteration, trying to understand the best and optimal solutions to this system. And interestingly, as an urbanist, I pulled these two images from their research. That through that testing, it wasn't the bolts that failed, it was the hinge. And so it's the linkages that they went back and further tested further optimized so that they could have this beautiful work of both architecture, art, and engineering. And I encourage all of you, if you don't have time, I think it's like 20 minutes walk uh, down to the museum, to see the exhibit, to see how these issues relate, not just in the structure of this rigid origami, but the sense of scale and that we have the ability to further examine and explore these. So if we start with buildings and infrastructure, and we start to understand the role of nature in addressing and solving some of these challenges, we address then a more elemental part of how we build cities, which is the integrity of the ecological systems and the supply of food and nutrition back into those natural systems. That will then create the loop and address the social dimension of our work. And perhaps this is a direction that is more about uh, ecological urbanization 
uh, and perhaps looking at how we restore the breaks in the chain and the linkages between cities and nature. So a couple of examples of how we've been testing this research uh, real time. Uh, here in Chicago, just north of the city on an industrialized uh, part of the riverfront, uh, we've been developing a project we've called the Wild Mile. It's a mile from end to end. It was once natural and had the interaction we strive for in these investments in infrastructure. It has gone through an evolution of industry and today is still struggling with those challenges of what was left behind. But it's also integrated into a much more vibrant, diverse, inclusive community. So how do we solve many of these challenges? At the same time, introduce recreation, expand the, diverse, the biodiversity of habitat? And how can you do that within very limited space? So sort of through our pushing and pulling with city officials, we found we were able to really look at the 20 feet on either side of the canal. We worked with a number of scientists and engineers to come up with this idea of a habitat mosaic. And perhaps on the non-city side, on the west side, that can much be uh, more integrated with urban, uh, excuse me, ecological uh, systems. And that on the east side, it's much more a uh, place for people, for connections, for movement. We all know how to do this. But in solving those solutions, can it have greater impact? Can it restore habitat and the health of the river? And we had an idea that we'd look back at nature. We'd test ideas on how we could create these modules to insert uh, into the river that could adapt and expand over time, taking their cues from science, looking at the layering of both the ecology uh, and sustainability of these systems so that when we look even in the very near term, we can see immediate impacts to this uh, floating, uh, as it's been called now, an ecological island uh, within the center of the city. And that becomes a place and a destination uh, for all Chicagoans. And sort of what's been most exciting is a community-led group called Urban Rivers uh, have taken this on. Many from our own studio have gone out on weekends to build these modules and to begin to float them into the river. So we've seen immediate success, immediate impact, great excitement from the community, even in the early stages. I think I'll run out of time if we wait for it to uh, float in the river, but trust me, it does. Let, let me move to an international waterfront. This is the Detroit River. Interestingly, Detroit is north on this drawing. Canada is to the south. It has had a significant past uh, in terms of how it's evolved, a uh, major heart of industry for the auto uh, companies that were there. But today, like many other cities, it's struggling with the issues of lack of investment, vacancy, depopulization. But the riverfront has remained a vital asset that is a place for everyone. And it's this common ground that was really critical to embrace in any future planning for the area. And so we had this idea to extend those connections back uh, into the community, create this rich urban framework to keep the waterfront open and public, to understand the importance to integrate nature back into that context, to look at the scale and relationship of those future buildings to spaces to create connections that did not exist, that would connect two miles into the community, back down to the riverfront, but also to work with local business owners to find new types of urbanization, infill, and repopulization. So jump in scales perhaps one more time. This sort of speaks to how big can we think. We've been fortunate to work with the Chinese government on a project that it's the second from the left, along the Yellow River, the Mother River, the heart of Chinese civilization, this 180 kilometer long park 
that we could design that links to the natural resources, that links to the future health of the city and those natural systems, but that takes on the fact that this is replacing farmland. And so how do we consider that not only in the design of the park, the creation of these cells that can be inserted at a much larger scale within this fabric, but that that provides a framework for the city of the future. And for us, this was about a self-sustaining city, a city that could generate its own energy, that could recycle its own waste, that could produce food at the scale of a neighborhood to reduce the amount of uh, traffic and movement of food from destination to destination so that it was grown locally. And how might that influence our thinking about the future urban form programs within the city? I don't know if this will work, but we were running simulations to also understand ventilation, thermal comfort, how we can improve the public realm, but also how that microclimate can be considered then in the context of the built form and how we would design our buildings. And that the result could be something much more green. It could be something that as the mayor of Janan has called it, focusing on smallness focusing on what it means to be of Janan and what it means to create a future model, not only for their city, for their province, but for the country as a whole. And so this is a very important point that for us as designers, we see that everything's connected and that if you remove the layers and you look at, for example, this diagram of watersheds, and I love this quote by a colleague of ours in, in Canada, Drew Wensley, that the way we build our cities, the way we create our energy, handle our waste, move our people, all contribute to breaks in the chain of our ecological systems. You know, and that's, that's a very thoughtful point in how we consider what's on the horizon here in Mexico and sort of the anticipation of continued growth and what's interestingly through our research is that this is unlikely to happen within the existing footprint, but in that larger pink bubble. And so how do we look at urbanization? How do we look at environmental systems? How does it continue to shape the form of the city? And so for the first time in human history, more people live in cities than not. The current system is unsustainable. We need to take new approaches and how we design them and how we want to live in them. The current model possesses inputs such as fossil fuels, food, and people to produce synergies of activity, culture, and economic development. But this model also generates output like greenhouse gases, waste, and inequality. And that this current linear metabolism both consumes and pollutes. It's time to build more efficient cities we must think beyond sustainability and resiliency and develop a net positive city, perhaps a city that regenerates itself. Regenerative cities can apply outputs from one system as inputs of another. Renewable energy, water conservation, and local food production influence the design of the built environment, including infrastructure, transportation, and land use. These improved regenerative efficiencies in turn mend our urban ecology. And as we look to create cities that are responsible to future generations, we must learn how to heal as we grow and in a manner that makes cities more equitable, just, and livable. And not only for a few, but for everyone. As designers, we are inspired by these challenges, such as how we focus on efficiency, where nature is the best designer, how we feed our city, we value every drop, we eliminate the concept of waste, we enhance competitiveness and distinction, we design for people, we live without a car, we find ways to honor culture and place, and we responsibly adapt to future change. not about S1. In closing, I had just a couple of thoughts. Our work as architects, engineers, urbanists, and designers 
reflects our professional commitment and passion to innovation problem solving. That's part of our identity. And if now more than ever, I think we need to see the value in multidisciplinary thinking and even greater collaboration. It is important to our global future that we see cities as ecosystems and that perhaps together we can advance a new ethos in urban habitat and city building. Thank you.